Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I would first like to acknowledge that we are presently located and are working on the traditional territory of the Nipushin or Anacostan and Piscataway, native peoples whose lands were forcibly taken and who have yet to receive justice. My name is Atiyah Ahmed. I'm an anthropologist and the director of the Institute of Middle East Studies, filling in for our colleague Mona Atiyah while she's on a much deserved sabbatical break. I am delighted to introduce this event, the latest in our Middle East Policy Forum events entitled The Last Front in the War in Court Inside the 9 11 Case at Guantanamo, featuring Lisa Haja, a professor of sociology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Excuse me, Santa Barbara. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Professor Hajar has an international reputation on sociology of law and conflict, human rights, political violence, and contemporary international affairs. Her current research focuses primarily on the U.S. war on terror, particularly around issues of torture, targeted killing, and Guantanamo. She is the only social scientist who has traveled to Guantanamo and has done so 14 times to date, where she conducts research and writes about the military commissions. Another area of current research focuses on human rights in the Arab world. An accomplished scholar, her work also circulates more broadly. Her journalistic writings have been published by The Nation, Al Jazeera English, The Middle East Report, and Jadaniya. In conversation with Professor Hajar, we have James Connell, who has served as death penalty counsel for Anar al baluchi in the United States Military Commissions at Guantanamo Bay since 2011. Before that position, Mr. Connell defended death penalty and other criminal cases in Virginia, Texas, and here in the District of Columbia. Among other cases, he worked as habeas counsel for so-called DC sniper John Allen Muhammad. We also have with us today Alka Pradhan, who is adjunct professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Pradhan is an expert on the application of human rights and humanitarian law to counterterrorism situations and the impact of torture on fair trials. She is currently human rights counsel at the Guantanamo Bay Military Commissions, representing one of the defendants in the capital case of U.S. versus Alid Sheikh Mohammed the 9-11 case. Now, before I speak the floor, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you other upcoming events for the Middle East Policy Forum. First, what's next in Yemen? A panel discussion with our practitioner and residents, Ruta Sangaswamy, Ahmed Nagy, Yazid al Jadawi, and Anel Shalini, taking place February the 23rd at 12 o'clock on Zoom. And second, we have Middle East Petrodollars and the Transformation of U.S. Empire from 1967 to 1988, featuring David M. Wright and our own Shana Marshall, who's here with us today, that is taking place March 24th at 2.15 p.m., both on Zoom and in person by the by. For today's event, we will, uh, our speakers will present for 45 minutes, followed by Q&A. Thank you again and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be at George Washington, and to, thank you to all the people who uh, made this possible. And it's really a pleasure to be with uh, Jay and Alka, not in Guantanamo, although I have the perverse sort of enjoy going to Guantanamo just because it's been such a profoundly important and devastating place to do research. So I'm just going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, my new book, The War in Court, uh, Inside the Long Fight Against Torture, and specifically about the 9-11 case. Both of them are um, defense lawyers for Amar al-Baluchi, one of the five 9-11 um, defendants. But just to sort of say how this book uh, came about. I mean, I had been working on issues of torture and law um, since the 1990s um, in the Israel-Palestine context. And after 9-11, <clears throat> I mean, immediately after 9-11, I started hearing things that Bush administration officials, specifically Dick Cheney, who I have quite a bit of fun with in the book, um, you know, were saying things, and it was clear to me that the United States was going to emulate the Israeli model by go, utilizing torture in the interrogation of people who, at the time those statements were made, there was nobody else yet in custody. 
But so one of the things that was, you know, fascinating to me, like even before um, anything, uh, you know, the, the, the material that becomes a subject of this book, so much about um, how the war on terror uh, was waged, particularly the capture and treatment of prisoners overseas was a secret for several years. And so what we now know many you know, decades later was that the, the, you know, many governments, for example, utilize torture, but only liberal governments feel the need to reinterpret the law in order to make things appear legal. If they want to coercively interrogate people or kidnap them, force disappearance, et cetera. So all of those things, in a sense, were going on. There wasn't much known in the first several years of the war on terror. But the book, The War in Court, really, I mean, it ultimately it's about lawyers, but it really begins, the story of the long fight against torture really begins with a couple of lawyers who, um, it was uh, the late Michael Ratner, who was the president of the Center for Constitutional Rights and two death penalty lawyers, um, Clive Stafford Smith and uh, Joseph Margulis, who kind of teamed up in, the ver in um, February, 2002 and brought the first lawsuit challenging President George W. Bush's authority to secretly detain people at Guantanamo. And so this was one month after the first prisoners had been brought to Guantanamo. And the Bush administration had basically, you know, President Bush had issued an executive order in um, November of 2001, before there were actually any prisoners really in US custody, saying that anyone that the United States uh, took into custody basically would have no rights to, um, to see any court anywhere to challenge his detention or his treatment. And so Guantanamo was selected because the US government wanted to engage in brutal and dehumanizing tactics, because people who didn't know anything about interrogation, Dick Cheney, um, persuaded themselves that the only way to get information out of nefarious enemies was to brutalize and degrade them. And so in order to brutalize and degrade them, they had to be somewhere where there could be no lawyers, where there could be no oversight. And so that's why Guantanamo was um, selected. So, you know, there's there's some long story. I'm happy to answer uh, questions about Guantanamo, but the um, separate from the military uh, interrogation and detention operations in Afghanistan and in Guantanamo, the CIA operated its own special program. I mean, they were at the CIA was authorized by President Bush just days after 9-11 to basically run a kidnapping and torture operation overseas. I mean, they didn't call, they call it uh, rendition, detention and interrogation. But so the CIA was looking for so-called high value suspects. And, you know, they they snatched up the first um, person, uh, someone uh, who's known the guerre is Abu Zubaydah, who remains in Guantanamo to this day. Um, Abu Zubaydah was picked up in uh, March of 2002 and fared it off to a secret, a black site, a secret prison. I would just, just to link how some of the things across these decades um, exist. The first, one of the first lawyers to challenge the Bush administration, you know, was uh, Joe Margulis in the case, that case was challenging secret detention at Guantanamo. He remains Abu Zubaydah's lawyer, you know, these many, you know, decades later, Nova Zubaida is still at Guantanamo. But the CIA, um, basically, what they did was they, you know, again, the United States is a country, of, you know, sort of fans, fancies itself to be a country of laws. And so the way in which the, um, the CIA and the Bush White House thought about how to you know, they persuade themselves that coercive interrogation techniques would be useful, necessary, and effective, and therefore would be legitimate. And so they hired two um, psychologists, uh, contracted two psychologists whose only claim to, you know, any form of relevant uh, experience was that they had been trainers in a program called the SEER program, Survival, Evasion, uh, Resistance, and Escape. I'm weaving you across time here, but the SEER program had been set up to train elite U.S. soldiers who might be at risk of being captured by governments that don't abide by the Geneva Conventions and are tortured. And so the idea was if people were trained to experience torture when they were actually tortured, they might not, you know, they might be strong enough to withstand. So these two psychologists basically reverse engineered the torture techniques, and that was what was authorized for the CIA to use on uh, people who were held in black sites, uh, including Jay and Alka's uh, client, Amar al-Baluchi. So the CIA 
you know, one of the important things I think about the 9-11 case uh, in particular was that in the beginning, when they first grabbed up Abu Zubaydah, who wasn't who they thought he was, but, you know, he was the guinea pig for the torture program. Um, basically, the government, the white, the Bush White House had promised the CIA that the people you take into custody will never see the light of day again. So it was an idea that we can do whatever we want, but they will be permanently disappeared because what they were about to do would have some very serious ramifications if it were to become public. So it was, you know, uh, the law, there was, I mean, it was really the lawyers of various kinds, hundreds of lawyers who were fighting different aspects of the Bush administration and then, you know, later the Obama administration, then the Trump administration, then the Biden administration's program treatment of prisoners. But in the early years, one of the, um, the a critical case uh, that really brought an end to the CIA's torture program was brought by a military uh, lawyer who was representing a Guantanamo detainee, and that was Lieutenant Commander Charles Swift. So he had been assigned to defend Salim Hamdan in the, in the first iteration of the military commissions. And so he teamed up with Neil Katyal, who's a Georgetown uh, law professor and frequent talking head on MSNBC. And they basically sued Donald Rumsfeld, Hamdan v. Rumsfeld, over the illegality of the military commissions. And when this, in that case got to the Supreme Court, that was like one of only three cases that really decisively, um, you know, the, the government lost. But in that case, the Salim, uh, the, the Hamdan v. Rumsfeld decision, which was issued in June of 2006, the Supreme Court said, yeah, the military commissions that Bush had created by executive fiat in November 2001 are unconstitutional. But the more important thing that the Hamdan decision said was that everyone in U.S. custody, meaning also including CIA custody, is covered by common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions, which basically makes prohibits torture, cruel treatment, and outrages on human dignity uh, and makes them war crimes. And so that was, a, you know, sort of a, a shocker. Uh, it really indicated that the CIA could not continue its torture and kidnapping operation as had been the case. And so while a Republican Congress passed the, something called the Military Commission Act in October, uh, giving back to the Bush administration what the Supreme Court had taken away, the Bush administration did realize that they couldn't continue having um, holding people and doing what they were doing to them in black sites. And so in September of 2006, 14 um, of the, the highest, allegedly highest of the high value uh, detainees, and put that in quotes, um, scare quotes, it were, were um, transferred to Guantanamo, you know, and then the idea was that they would be um, put on trial. But that was the, you know, the Bush administration was um, salivating over the prospect, particularly being able to prosecute, convict, get a death, yeah, guilty verdict, death sentence, and execute them by the time Bush left office in uh, in 2008. Well, just to sort of, I'm going to like now move towards what happened in this 9-11 case, but that didn't happen, um, obviously. <laughs> so what happened was um, the uh, these people had been tortured in unbelievable ways. I mean, I'm, I think that Alka and Jay can possibly tell you more about those experiences, but um, the and they were put into isolation in Guantanamo, isolated from each other. And basically, although they were technically under in a military base, the CIA basically continued to own them. Why? Because the CIA owns information about itself and their memories were literally classified. Like they were literally the walking embodiments of the CIA's torture program. And so because of that, that's that secrecy, you know, that has actually colored everything about the 9-11 case in its various iterations. In, in preparation for putting these guys on trial in the military commissions, even though the military commission rules that very, uh, you know, sort of favoring the government, in order to get statements that could be used in court, I mean, the government said, well, you know, we're not going to use anything that these guys had said in black sites. So FBI agents so-called clean team agents were sent down to Guantanamo in January of 2007 to interview all of the, um, the, the um, former CIA prisoners to get statements. And those statements were gonna become the basis for what the prosecution would use in its case. So let me just say that the Bush administration tried to put them on trial you know, in 2008 
the trial fell apart like in December of 2008, just a month or two before Bush was actually, his term was done because the defendants had basically agreed, said they had made an offer to plead guilty on the condition that they go directly to execution. In other words, like martyrdom by military commission. Well, as shitty as the military commission um, statute was, it didn't have a, a clause for, you know, death penalty without um, trial. Case collapses, Obama comes to um, office, uh, Obama, you know, feigning liberalism, um, you know, promises to uh, try them in, the plan is to try them in New York, you know, few Republicans and Fox News commentators uh, complain. Obama does what he does and he cancels his own plans. And then they were rearranged re in the military commissions and recharged in 2011 and arraigned in 2012. This is 2022. That trial has never moved. 9-11 case has never moved beyond the pretrial hearing. And what is so significant about the, that case and what is so significant about the work of the lawyers who were doing it, these two and, and the others, is that they were litigating, trying to you know, fight for the rule of law in a case where the defendants had been brutally tortured, kidnapped and tortured by the government that wants to execute them. And what happened to them was secret, remained secret, even though the, the CIA torture program was you know, definitively canceled in, in, by Obama in 2009. What happened to these guys in their years in CIA custody was a secret. And because of what happened to them in CIA custody was a secret, they were treated and are treated as if, like no one, like anything that they say is regarded as presumptively top secret. You know, and so just the, the the gyrations that people had to go through just to try and uh, pull forward, you know, any kind of evidence on uh, or, or movement on the case. So as I would see it, and I, you know, I I started going to Guantanamo in 2010 for another case. In 2013, I began uh, most of my um, subsequent trips. Like I think I made 11 trips since uh, 14 trips in total, but 11 of them for the 9/11 case to watch. And as a sociologist. You know, what, you know, I'm posing as a journalist, not posing, I'm really kind of journalist. <laughs> I mean, I do write <laughs> journalistically, but it's like, that was my entree. I couldn't be like, I'm a sociology professor, I'd like to go to Guantanamo and research torture. That wasn't the way it was going to go. But being there and being there over such a long period of time, over so many times, and being able to see what the lawyers were arguing in court, what was going on, the way in which I would just sort of really briefly summarize it, was that between 2012 and 2017, all the pretrial hearings, five teams of lawyers and the prosecutors were basically this ongoing fight by the defense teams for information. What happened to our clients in CIA black sites? And I mean, it was, and the prosecutors were literally as representatives of the government and were literally carrying water for the CIA because of the fact that whatever information could be um, given to the defense teams in discovery, the CIA had to vet it. And so there would be all this, you know, providing summaries and substitutions and um, all kinds of you know, ways of coding and shading or whatever the information. And so it was literally year after year. And these two are like two of the best, you know, incredible fighters. And you're just watching something that it, you know, I mean, people would say, it's a, it's redundant to call Guantanamo Kafkaesque, but it really, really is Kafkaesque. But something happened then in 2017. It was kind of a break in the case that altered what was going on. And it was like in December of 2017, finally, um, the defense teams and then also the journalists got FBI memos. And it was the FBI memos about pertaining to the clean team interrogations in um, 2007. So it's like 10 years later, the FBI, the, the defense teams learned about this. And so two of the defense uh, or the FBI agents who had been clean team interrogators come down to Guantanamo and it kind of blew the lid off of the whole operation because what came out in court in questioning during that December 17, 2017 thing was that although the FBI, the whole point of clean teams, like clean means don't be dirty, don't touch the CIA, the CIA is dirty or clean. What came out in the, um, in the, um, in the questioning of, of these FBI agents was that they were literally run by the, the CIA. Like they were, the, the CIA was running the FBI. And that opened up 
a new kind of scenario. I'm really abbreviating things, but what happens then really in the you know coming years after that, and it was led by Jay Cannell's team, was you know the kind of a switch from the fight for information to a fight to suppress evidence to, to suppress the FBI statements because they had been they were fruit of the poisonous tree etc and so you then got um you know month after month year after year efforts to kind of essentially for the defense teams and again this it was this team's um suppression motion that was litigated all the other uh defense teams kind of benefited but they were basically using this case to make the argument that there is no after torture there is no after torture. There is no, you know, moment at which you know torture's over, and therefore anything that these people who have been spent years in CIA custody would say is 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 legally reliable, etc. And so the case itself was very much, you know, a, an evidence, you know, in a larger case of the egregious mistakes that the U.S. government had made in imagining or fantasizing that torture and justice could somehow be reconciled. But the fact that the Guantanamo, you know, Guantanamo remains open and the 9-11 case, now it's entered into plea bargain negotiations, um, you know, in March of 2022, partially because I think that the prosecution has, has realized that there is no way they can get what one administration after another had wanted, which was guilty verdicts, death sentences, and executions. And so now they're doing plea bargaining. Um, and I'll uh, turn it back over to them. But I just wanted to say that, you know, it's, the, the, the significance of this case um, is, is such that, you know, it is the, the fact that it's unresolved, the fact that what the U.S. government did to um, human beings in CIA uh, custody remains a secret for all intents and purposes, and that there's been no acknowledgement. I mean, there's been that sort of many people talk about that there's now like Guantanamo evokes like an amnesia. Most people are like, oh, is it still open? I didn't even know. Like, who's down there? What's going on? You know, it's like this is a chapter of U.S. history that is still being written. And frankly, it would have never been, you know, written at all had it not been for lawyers who took up, I mean, many hundreds of lawyers in different ways, but lawyers who took up the cause for like defending principles of the rule of law. And I think that it behooves, you know, people who are interested in, you know, understanding fully what the U.S. government has done over the last two decades is to really think about, you know, what happened at Guantanamo and particularly with the 9-11 case. So it's really a pleasure to be on stage with these two. So I don't know which one of you wants to go first. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Lisa just did an amazing job of summarizing a vast amount of information <laughs> involving hundreds of people uh, over 20 years. So um, I've, I've never tried to do that before. It was really, really <laughs> yeah. impressive. Uh, so basically, I'm just here for color commentaries. Um, and when I read Lisa's book, uh, which is really the first of its kind, you, you might suspect given the billions and billions of dollars that were spent across DOD and CIA and other organizations um, in the legal aspect of the war on terror that, that it might be better covered, but it's actually not. And this is really the first book of its kind. There have been strictly legal treatments, but um, Lisa has really brought the sociological pulling back of the lens to see what was going on. And that was one of the things that I took from the book, um, which was just how important it was that people show up year after year to fight against injustice, because there's, there's kind of a mythology uh, driven by movies mostly that, you know, that law is a one person job and the one person you know, my cousin Vinny or whoever it is shows up in court, gives a brilliant cross examination, and then and then the case gets the defendant falls apart. But that's not the way that it really works. Um, the the defense of big cases is a team sport, but the pursuit of justice as a country is a team sport, and it takes hundreds of people uh, showing up year after year uh, to keep our country uh, and our world on an even keel. Uh, towards the rule of law and democracy. And one might question, you know, how well we've been doing in that uh, recently, but uh, but it's not for failure of the lack of a lot of people to try uh, to keep us to, committed to the values that this country espouses, even though it frequently hasn't lived up to. 
So a few things. Um, the first is one of those groups that's shown up year after year for many years now is, is the death penalty community. And um, hearing Lisa talk about Clive Stafford Smith being one of the first people to, uh, <clears throat> to bring a case uh, around Guantanamo, it reminds me that around 2002, um, I was at a death penalty conference, the most famous, biggest death penalty conference uh, for lawyers that there was, which at the time was called Airly. It was started by the um, uh, NAACP in Virginia at a time when uh, the, this uh, resort in Airly, Virginia was the only place which would allow African Americans to stay there. And so that became the, in the 50s, that became the site for, it's moved some now, that became the site for this early conference. And around 2002, I remember uh, going to a farewell party at that, um, at that event for Clive Stafford Smith because he was living, leaving um, the South in Mississippi where he had done most of his work and was moving on to challenging Guantanamo. And I remember thinking at the time, uh, you know, we're not done here. We need you here, um, but and and what is this Guantanamo thing? And um, it, it, you know, he's an example of of one of the many people who has showed up uh, year after year uh, to seek justice. And another one of those of those people who showed up year after year to document what's going on is Lisa Hajar. And so, in on um, August twenty seventh, two thousand eleven, uh, almost thirteen years ago now, uh, um, almost uh, twelve years ago now. Um, I went to work for the DOD on this case alone. I did a death penalty lawyer in Virginia and some in Texas and DC, but, um, but was going to be working on this one case, Mara Bellucci. And at the time, um, I had been sort of lured away from my private practice with the promise that the case was gonna be charged by the 10th anniversary of 9-11 on September 11th, uh, 2011. And it was going to be in trial uh, by September 11th, 2012. Um, and so, I only had it, my job was only for 18 months in the Department of Defense. Uh, I left all my furniture in my old building. I still owned a third of the building. You know, I, I was like, don't worry, folks, I'll be back shortly. Don't worry, <laughs> this is not going to take very long. Uh, because that's that was the plan, right? That this was going to, they were just going to ram through convictions. They were going to ram through charges. They were going to ram through an execution. And that was the plan. And I, at the time, didn't have any reason to believe that um, it, it wouldn't happen that way. So on the, when you go to work at the Department of Defense, the first day is an astonishing amount of, uh, of bureaucracy that you have to work through. And you have to fill out form after form and you know, select all kinds of life insurance and all kinds of other things. But apparently it turns out on the second day of going to work for the DOD, Lisa Hajar comes and interviews you um, <laughs> because on August 28th of, of 2011, um, when I showed up to work, there was Lisa Hajar uh, on my first day in the actual office. Um, and one of our colleagues <laughs> said, um, this is Lisa Ajar. She's going to interview you about what it's like to work in military commissions. And I'm like, I have no idea what it's like to work in military commissions. I, I just got here and I don't even know where to park. Um, uh, but Lisa from that time has been a devoted, uh, and, and before that I'm sure, but has been a devoted uh, observer of the military commissions. And I always appreciate the uh, her view. One of the, most uh, one of my most treasured views uh, was in January of, of 2020, um, when uh, Mitchell and Jessen, who uh, Lisa mentioned, um, came down to Guantanamo to testify, and uh, Alka examined Jessen, and um, I had the privilege of examining Mitchell, uh, and the whole thing was live blocked by Lisa. And so, you know, I hope on on Twitter. So I hope that one day uh, Lisa will go back, at, if Twitter still exists, right? So you better get this stuff quickly. <laughs> Um, uh, go back and scrape all that up and um, really give a kind of uh, very close view of what was happening um, during that examination, which was uh, really one of the, I think for most of us, one of the most important moments in the case and, and probably represented a real turning point in various people, including the prosecutions, thinking about what it meant to torture people. And what it meant to, as Lisa said, try to have an after torture that honestly does not exist. So um, thank you and I'll go. Um, thank you so much. It's 
such I sit at a table a lot with Jay and I don't get to sit at a table as much with Lisa, but it's always a pleasure. Um, I do really want to echo what Jay said about uh, just thanking people like Lisa, which there are very few who have made the time and taken the effort to come down to Guantanamo. As um, some of you may know, um, I'm just going to go ahead and call out Ron sitting at the back right there, mm -hmm. um, who is our uh, public affairs officer who helps coordinate down to Guantanamo. Um, it is extraordinarily difficult to come down to Guantanamo, and that's by design, right? I mean, as Lisa talked about, coming to Guant Guantanamo was chosen because it is essentially an offshore prison um, where no law applies. And so they can control very tightly who comes down, under what circumstances, for what period of time, and what your conditions are when you come down there. And frankly, when you come down there, it's not the most comfortable, and it's not the most fun. Um, it is very, very grim. And... Sometimes the most fun you have is going to the gift shop and seeing what distasteful additives they have now. Mm -hmm. So um, many, many thanks to Lisa for coming down as many times as she has, um, which exceeds some of the number of times that council are able to go down, honestly, uh, over the course of some years. Um, I came in to Guantanamo uh, actually from, it, some of you may be aware, but some of you may not, that there are actually two very different parts to Guantanamo. One is what we call the habeas side, uh, which are the vast majority of the men, of the nearly 800 men who've been held down there, um, are on that side. And those are the men who were sort of rounded up post 9 11 uh, when we went to Afghanistan and uh, brought back to Guantanamo to be sorted and figure out who exactly we had rounded up. Um, we ended up finding out, of course, that uh, a large proportion of those people had, in fact, been sold to us for bounty. Uh, President Musharraf, who just passed away, wrote in his book that uh, they earned many millions of dollars from uh, men sold to the U.S. government for bounty. And the, you know, the reality was that we just didn't have the resources on the ground in Afghanistan or in Pakistan to figure out exactly what we were getting. As early as the fall of 2002, General Dunleavy uh, went from then the head of, there were two different task forces, and I won't go too far into this, but General Dunleavy was largely in charge of things in Guantanamo at that time, the fall of 2002, and actually made a surprise trip to Afghanistan to say, excuse me, what is going on? Why are you sending us people who have nothing to do with the so-called war? Um, and so, I was actually hired, Clive has come up several times, where I was hired by Clive um, to work for uh, Reprieve here in the United States uh, in D.C. to handle the habeas cases, the cases of the guys who, uh, this was in 2013, so this is about 10, 10, 10 years ago now, that's the first time I've done that math, um, 10 years ago, to represent Reprieve's clients at Guantanamo who were eligible to be cleared for release, so getting them cleared and then actually negotiating some of their releases that are actually unfortunately still there 10 years later. Um, so that's the habeas side of it. That's, um, that's, you know, a really, everything about Guantanamo is tragic and demoralizing, but that part of it is particularly so because the men were taken to Guantanamo, tortured, were never charges brought against any of them. They were never going to be charges brought against any of them. And they are, many of them are still there. Uh, by many of my clients, at least, are still there today. But in so in 2015, I had a call from um, a colleague of ours, actually, in the military commission, saying, "Hey, DOD is hiring civilians. Would you be interested?" And my first reaction was, uh, "No, thank you." Uh, it's just, I, you know, I'm already working at Guantanamo. The military commission is a whole other animal. Um, but then, you know, it sort of occurred to me, you can't really get any deeper into Guantanamo than the military commissions. I mean, that is, it's really this deep, dark hole that nobody gets to see very much of. Um, you know, the transfer and the negotiations around those is in many ways more visible than military commissions. So if you really want to understand what we were trying to do at Guantanamo, what we, the United States, were trying to do at Guantanamo, military commissions are the place to go. Um, so I ended up being very lucky and being able to join joined the uh, defense team of Amor al Baluchi, which is our budget, um, in 2015. And I learned a lot. And what, you know, what Amar always wants us to do in these situations is talk about him. So let's talk about Amar.
everything we have, everything I learned has been through this lens of, of this person, Amar al -Baluch. And Amar is 45 years old. He's turning 46 in August. He was arrested in Pakistan in, uh, at the end of April uh, 2003. And he was held in Pakistan for a certain amount of time and then eventually ended up at the CIA black sites. His torture was just absolutely brutal at the CIA black sites. He was held at a site that's codenamed Cobalt in Senate Intelligence Committee report. Um, and has any, have y'all seen Zero Dark Thirty? Has anybody seen Zero Dark Thirty? I don't recommend it. It's not great Hollywood as it turns out, but if you have seen it, you know that the first like 20 minutes or so uh, of that film showed the torture of a detainee named Amar. They were so lazy they didn't even change his name. Um, and the reason for that is because the CIA uh, gave classified information to the filmmakers that they did not actually give to us as defense counsel uh, it, for the making of that film. Because at the time that that film was being made, uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee was working on their final report that they knew would not make the CIA look very good because of their torture program. And the CIA that uh, successfully that more Americans would watch a movie featuring Jessica Chastain than would read a you know several hundred page report uh, or executive summary of a report that still remains classified to this day about CIA torture. And they were right. Um, that film actually, along with a lot of other propaganda that the CIA and the US government at large has put out about Guantanamo and about the CIA torture program has shaped uh, a lot of public opinion about what we did post 9-11 and how effective it was. Um, and I think is one of the main reasons that such a large percentage of, percentage of Americans still believe that torture is effective. But I digress. Among the things that happened to Amar at, uh, at Cobalt, which is the first place he was held, were, was he was, you know, he was stripped, he was subjected to sexual humiliation. He had his head bashed against the wall uh, repetitively for hours at a time, so hard that he suffered multiple traumatic brain injuries and in fact brain damage where parts of his brain are missing now because of what the CIA did to him. In The reason they did it for so long is because they were treating him as a training prop, which was actually not our words, the words of James Mitchell, the architect, uh, one of the architects of the CIA torture program. Um, so human experimentation at the Black Sites. Um, he was, you know, subjected to standing sleep deprivation, um, shackled for long periods of time in what they call stress positions. Um, he had a rod placed behind his knees and was forced to kneel, separating joints in his knees uh, for starvation. Um, he was tortured with water, which is a lot of people talk about water boarding, um, and the CIA in their rebuttal, I think, like like to talk about the fact that really only three people were waterboarded. That's actually a lie. There were more than three people waterboarded, but there were many more people tortured with water, and Amar was one of them, right? He was put on a tarp and water was freezing water was manipulated around him to simulate drowning. Through all of this, he was being interrogated. He was being interrogated day after day after day, every single day. And some of the people writing the questions for him to be interrogated with during his torture are FBI agents here at home who are well aware of the conditions at these black sites and are never and are are about to embark on a PR campaign in which they say we walked away as soon as we knew that the CIA was torturing people, but in fact continued to send questions to the black sites to people who they knew were being tortured. Take that information back and incorporate it into what became, you know, the 9-11, the pet bomb FBI investigation into 9-11 and the 9-11 commission. If you look up the 9-11 commission on the internet and you look at the footnotes that say detainee reporting, that is detainee reporting from the black sites under torture which there are many reasons to call the 9-11 Commission report into question, but that um, jumped to the top of my list of things once we learned that. Um, so Omar has cycled through several other black sites. He's tortured using sleep deprivation, 24-7 uh, lights, uh, loud music for uh, a significant chunk of the three and a half years that he spends 
at the black sites, and then he moved to Guantanamo in September 2006. He's moved with 13 other so-called high-value detainees, um, and I, you know, we could talk for half an hour about what that term actually means. They're, the only meaning of that term, high-value detainees, when you read it in the news or when you hear it on TV, is that they, those are the detainees that were held in the CIA torture program. It doesn't actually speak to what their actual intelligence value was to the United States. Um, they bring them to Guantanamo. After a few months, as Lisa uh, sort of outlined, they the men are reinterrogated by FBI agents. Those FBI agents, in some cases, are the same ones who were sending questions to the black sites and know exactly how those questions were answered under torture. Um, all of this, it took us. We're still actually, we're still learning a great deal uh, about all of this. We got discovery, what, like yesterday? Yesterday on uh, on some of these topics, but but we didn't have this breakthrough. You know, Lisa mentioned 2017. It wasn't until May 28, six years into pretrial hearings, in a hearing I will never forget, um, when the prosecutor stood up and said sheepishly, to then Judge Cole, the first of our seven, seven judges um, in the 9-11 case. Um, sir, we actually didn't realize the extent of cooperation between the FBI and the CIA um, until just now. Um, never mind the fact that they, several of the prosecutors had been in the room as the CIA was instructing the FBI on how to conduct these clean team interrogations in 2006. I, I recount a lot of this just to sort of give color to the immense conspiracy. Everyone says, don't be a conspiracy theorist. That's what we've had to become um, in the course of this work because it is so unbelievable that the US government for administrations now would continue to perpetuate this conspiracy to the extent that they have. We can tell you that, you know, there's, a little bit of information that everybody has about the CIA torture program that y'all can look up on the internet. There's a little bit more classified information that we have, right? There's a little bit more than that information that the prosecutors in our case have, and then the CIA owns everything else. Um, and so there is still a vast amount of information that is not known about the program. We don't even know about the program. To just finish up, um, you know, we talk a lot about the legal ramifications of the case and where we are on plea negotiations. And if we don't, plea negotiations fall through, we'll go back to litigation. Um, but, you know, Amar is still up. And so are 34 other men, all of whom were tortured by the United States, whether at Guantanamo or first at the Black Sites and then at Guantanamo. And they all are suffering medical effects from their torture. Uh, and one of the defining characteristics of life at Guantanamo has been that the United States government refuses to provide, refuses to provide proper medical care, proper holistic torture care for the men who are being tortured, in part because that would involve, um, you know, disclosures and acknowledgement of what happened to them. And so Amar's traumatic brain injuries have never been treated, right? Amar's various, you know, problems with his ligaments, problems with his sleep, right? He can't sleep anymore for an entire night because of the extent of his sleep deprivation at the black side have never been treated. There are um, there are other detainees with other very serious problems. One of you may have heard about Nashwan Altamir. And um, Megan is here. Megan represents Nashwan Altamir, who has had six spinal surgeries at Bay at a you know, in a facility where the chief medical officer who works for DOD works with U.S. government has acknowledged that they don't have the capacity for complex medical care. So those issues are still percolating. And and instead of prioritizing the humanitarian aspects of it, the U.S. government continues to prioritize secrecy. So I will stop there. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Well, before I do, you guys still think of a question, I want to ask uh, these two a question, because something I've always wondered, you know, looking at um, lawyers, particularly defense lawyers, like my earlier work was on the Israeli military courts in the West Bank and Gaza, so it's a somewhat different thing in certain ways, but some defense lawyers working in a system that they themselves regard as illegitimate 
ultimately, you know, it becomes this, um, you know, uh, dilemma for themselves, like an ethical dilemma of whether or not they're actually supporting the system by continuing to do that work or not. And some people make the argument that, well, it is a corrupted system, but if I'm not there, nobody's, like, these people need their lawyers. Other people, you know, basically wash their hands of it. I'm just wondering whether either of you, or if you're aware of lawyers working on the cases at, at the military commissions have been struggling through those ethical questions. I. I don't struggle with it, but I did, I mean, I don't know if, if Jay may have had the same experience, but when I first started at the military commissions, I was coming from habeas, as I said, and a lot of the NGOs I had been working with were like, they're just legitimizing mm -hmm. the commissions, right? It's one thing to do habeas work and work to get people out. It's mm -hmm. another thing to actually work within this, this illegal court and legal mm -hmm. system. And I mean, my I'd never actually saw it that way. I think my rationale, and you know, I think, I think we share this is that I have always seen the military commissions as the single best method of accountability for the CIA mm -hmm. um, to the extent that we can get things declassified, that we can go out and talk, you know, about some of this stuff, that we can talk about our clients, that we can discuss the illegality of it, as long as we're not muzzled on that front. I think, look, there are no trials for CIA agents, you know, there's no truth and reconciliation commission, nothing has happened. I think, and prosecution hates it when I say this, so I'm going to look right in the camera and say it, I think the military commissions, if they've accomplished anything, um, it has been the single best way to get more information about the CIA's torture program out in public. I agree. Um, so I came to military commissions from the death penalty world, and the same question frequently comes up, right, by participating in what are essentially death penalty trials or death penalty habits, are you legitimating the system? And the way that I view it is there are really two fundamental approaches that anyone can take to an injustice. The first of those is a boycott, effectively used by many activists throughout, the, throughout this last century. Um, and the second one is engagement. And in my view, when confronted with an injustice, you have to choose between those two. And you can choose to boycott uh, that can be very legitimate. I do not disagree with anyone who chooses boycott as an approach, but personally for me, it has always been engagement. There are people who run from the fire and there are people who run toward the fire. And I'm one of the people who runs toward the fire. Um, everybody has to make that decision for themselves. But in my mind, you fight, when you decide to engage against injustice, you fight on whatever battleground is available to you. And if that means, you know, a, a terrible, federal court uh, that is looking at a habeas case under the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, uh, which Clinton passed to gut habeas corpus as a, a way to stop uh, executions, or whether that's a military commission where you're engaging with uh, the proponents of opting out of civilian control of, of courts and opting out of the prohibition against torture, then that's where you fight them. So that's my view of it. Do you like me to moderate or would you? Right. I'm happy to do it. Somebody, I have a question. We can just keep on talking. All right, Shana. <laughs> uh, this might be something that nobody wants to comment on, but uh, I'm thinking um, if you believe that maybe you can draw a line between um, Guantanamo and the development of like drone strike technology, right? Because the experience of the US government has been, right, that now they have all these detainees. The one thing I think everybody, right, wants to do is just get rid of them somehow, whether they die, they kill them, they get sick, there's a hurricane in Guantanamo and it wipes out the prison, whatever. Everybody in the government just wants it over. And so the that sort of move toward this very antiseptic sort of um, impersonal drone strike has been, because of this, um, you know, these detainees that are are here and it's visceral and it's physical and you can see them and you know, they're there and the efforts to sort of make that you know, far removed actually pushed that sort of technology or, you know, war fighting into that much different. Right, I mean, I actually begin the book, the. It's called, it's called the prologue or the preface, one of those P words. That, that, that begins with uh, Obama's announcement of the killing of Osama 
uh, bin Laden on May 1st, 2011. And I use that occasion to uh, introduce exactly this argument that um, targeted killing, so-called targeted killing replaced capture, uh, detention, interrogation as a strategic cornerstone of the war on terror. And the reason the, 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 um, its ability to do so was because of the kind of expanded executive power that the Bush administration accreted to itself, which Obama basically, while you know, being critical of torture, utilized to expand um, drone warfare that, that had started under the Bush administration. So that's the, and I'll, I'll say something else about the expansion of executive power, but the reason um, targeted killing, supplanted uh, capture and interrogation was because of torture, but not just torture. It was because lawyers fought torture. Like, in other words, it became too politically costly, you know, by 2007, 2008, once you really are, information is coming out, there's been the Abu Ghraib scandal and, you know, details are coming out in, you know, journalists. Uh, and by the way, we should just give a shout out to Carol Rosenberg, who's like the, yeah. the, 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 you know, chronicler par excellence of everything. And John but, Ryan, he shows up. John Ryan too, yeah, from Law Dragon. Um, absolutely. They're, they're down there the most. But I would just say that, you know, it was because lawyers you know, challenge the, um, the U.S. government. And I'm talking military lawyers, corporate lawyers, human rights lawyers, family lawyers, one way or another, challenging the government's prisoner policies and, and then the exposure of the fact that the Bush administration had authorized torture that just made, it wasn't because, you know, officials were like, oh, torture was terrible. What were we thinking? It was like, torture made us look bad. Let's just kill people, you know, instead of capturing them. And so, but the same hubristic assumption that you know drove the Bush administration in its earliest days before they even had, you know, President Bush had issued what's going to happen to people we capture was already operating on this hubristic assumption that everyone we would take into custody would be a terrorist, and every terrorist would have information, and the, and the only way to get information out of them would be to use coercive interrogation techniques, and then whatever they say becomes true in this kind of thing. Well, even while torture and detention are given up, the same hubristic, nonsensical, we know all kind of intelligence thing uh, uh, you know, drove the, the drone warfare program. Everyone we kill is a terrorist. They are enemies killed in action, EKIA. You know, that kind of logic that Obama, you know, embraced and then Trump even expanded on it further is all sort of rooted in the same expansion of executive power. And I just want to say one thing about how um, executive power was extended. So we're living we are living in Dick Cheney, in a world that Dick Cheney made. Like Dick Cheney and a small group of radical right wing lawyers, um, you know, who had basically, you know, I mean, Cheney had always, uh, you know, bristled against the kind of um, legal reforms that were instituted in the aftermath of the Vietnam War and the exposure of COINTELPRO, et cetera. There were like, in the 1970s, new guardrails were put on to prevent the executive or FBI and CIA from doing certain things. Cheney hated that. He wanted to roll that back. And there was this right-wing legal theory called the unitary executive thesis. I mean, uh, the late Antonin, Justice Antonin Scalia had sort of said that, you know, when the president is acting in his capacity as commander in chief in the interest of national security or foreign affairs, it would be unconstitutional for his powers to be fettered. This is, it's like some, it's called the unitary executive thesis. Well, it started, you know, you know, build, holding sway in right-wing circles in the 1980s, building up. When Cheney became vice president, he basically wanted to institute that vision. And so he surrounded himself by a small group of lawyers. And that was the vision that created Guantanamo. That was the vision that, you know, had the president authorizing torture techniques proclaiming that the Geneva Conventions don't apply, et cetera. And, you know, there's been, my book, you know, traces many um, battles, you know, in court across the 20 years of the war on terror. And a few of them, the significant ones, I mentioned Hamdan, like two or three, but overwhelmingly U.S. courts have been unable, have failed to stop this contralegal executive excess kind of a thing because of the idea that what the nature of like sort of judicial interpretations of executive power. And when people say executive power is whatever we say it is, the judiciary for the most part has failed. Congress obviously has failed to like dial that back in, but we are living in a world that Dick Cheney made. Can I just add to that real fast? Mm -hmm. um, Lisa, I used to 
represent civilian drug attack victims um, for a short time. And the one thing that I think mentioned in the book as well, but that I think should be just said out loud as much as possible is that the common thread between Guantanamo and the drone program, one did lead to it, the other, right? Turns out the one, one of the few things worse than torture is extrajudicial killing. But the common thread is the dehumanization and racism against people of color, right? Guantanamo was created for non, largely non-citizen Muslim men, right? It remains that way. And, you know, it is, it, it was created to be invisible. It has gained visibility over 21 years, right? So people vaguely know that the, we have these brown men down there, but we also generally assume that, well, they must all be terrorists because that propaganda really stuck, right? They must all be terrorists. That's why McConnell can stand up in Congress, you know, last week and say, you know, the terrorists at Guantanamo, they're not, you know, like if you look at the numbers, Jesus. Anyway, but it turns out that what is less visible than holding brown men on an island away from the United States is just killing them, right? In different places that don't, cannot then become a locus, right? A focal point for human rights organizations. And so if you just, you know, send a drone into Pakistan or in rural Yemen or whatever, like there'll be outrage that you hit a wedding party for a week and a half. But at the end of the day, like we are just not as a country wired to care about people of color outside of the United States, really not, some would argue not inside the United States either, thanks to structural racism. So I, I think, you know, we need to talk about Guantanamo and a lot of the post 9-11 programs as fundamentally built off of racism and, and you know, allowed to perpetuate to this day because of that. So my one piece of that is, Lisa has another book, Courting Conflict, um, that is really great sociological examination of um, attorneys working in the Israeli courts defending Palestinians largely. And Lisa, in her opening remarks, talked about you know the question of whether the United States was going to adopt an Israeli-style policy uh, using torture as an instrument of judicial or quasi-judicial um, fact finding. The the thing, one of the things that jumps out at me out of that is that, you know, Israel had a targeted killing policy long before the invention of of UAVs or drones as we think of them now. It's not the fact that it is an that it is an unpiloted vehicle that's the problem. The problem is that that drone strikes, like other targeted killings, whether they're piloted by a person or not, are have operate on a legal basis that erodes what the law of war has always been. Because like, if you had to summarize the law of war, one thing, it's that military are military and civilians are civilians. And once you decide that we can take a whole big group of civilians and we can sweep them into the people who it is lawful to target, then whether you're targeting them with a, with a UAV or whether you're targeting them with a helicopter, uh, you then you have degraded the fundamental difference between, between a military society and a democratic society because you have to have a sharp line between those who it is permissible to just kill, which is military that you're in a war with, and other people who need judicial processes. And so it, to me, there is a little bit of, of falsity to the dichotomy between a transition from we're going to stop torture and we're going to start drone killing, although I know it looks that way from, a, from an examination of policies of the Obama administration, but really they are both fruit of the same evil, which is the degradation of the lines between military and civilians, who it is permissible to, to kill on site and who it's not. Yes, Christian. This is a question from our online audience. How did Daniel Jones's torture report play into the MCDO's defense strategy? Huh, that's good. Actually, I have a Daniel Jones story. Um, <laughs> when I the day when I met uh, the, the woman who um, introduced me to Jay was uh, a woman named Catherine um, oh, Catherine. Mm -hmm. 
Newell. Newell, Catherine Newell, sorry. Catherine Newell. And she was the um, military commission defense office's torture expert. And she was working, she worked for you know several years to try and help all the defense teams representing CIA former um, people held by the CIA. And so she was basically like looking through all of the open source material about CIA torture, because she wanted to understand really what happened at the most granular level. And this is like 2010, 2011, uh, et cetera, at the most granular level um, to people in the military in, in when they were held in black sites. And the reason why, it, you know, so Daniel Jones is the Senate staffer who actually was working on on, on the, the for the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence to put together their report on the CIA's torture program. He's played by Adam um, Driver in the movie The Report. Uh, just to keep the pop culture. But one of the things was like that when Catherine Newell finished her report, um, somebody passed it on to um, to Jones, and he found it very useful in his own negotiations with the CIA because the CIA was attempting to to insist that things that the Senate wanted to including the report without redaction, um, which, which should be classified, even though it was, you know, Newell had gotten it through open sources. And the one thing I would say is that she referred, you know, tongue in cheek to this report she was working on for like a year and a half as the ass lesion report. And the reason she called it that was she's like, just use the, the phenomenon of ass lesions as an example. Like in a CIA black site, if someone develops an ass lesion, at what point does medical intervention occur? When the lesion is first detected or when the lesion grows to a much larger thing? And it was just like an illustration of the totality of CIA control over people's bodies and minds, you know, so that. So I would say that Jones's work, you know, was ex extremely important. I just keep wishing that somebody would leak the whole 6,300 page report. There's only two copies of it left to my knowledge. One copy of this piece of American history. What did the CIA do and what were the consequences of its thing that the Senate um, wrote? One uh, copy of the report was, is held in, the, in Obama's presidential archive, but Obama issued um, an order that it should be kept secret for the longest amount of time possible by law. And the other is in a uh, safe in the Pentagon because the 9-11 lawyers had been, you know, um, petitioning for years. They have top secret clearance. They should be able to see the full 6,300 page unredacted report. But, you know, the government has fought against that. So there's a second copy locked away. But when Republican, after the report was released in 2000, or the executive summary in 2014, that in that midterm election, Republicans took control of the Senate, and they immediately called back, recalled all of the other copies of the report that had been distributed to other government agencies with the intention of destroying them. And to my knowledge, they actually did destroy them or whatever. So that piece of history, there's only two copies of it left and it remains secret. I have three quick points on that mm -hmm. uh, question. Um, the first one is I do want to make clear that although it is not, not probably obvious to anybody outside, but the Military Commission's Defense Organization doesn't have strategies like <laughs> as, a, as a group. Um, we're all individual teams. We're under a, a common leader, but, um, but legal decisions are made by us and um, for each, fact, individual. for each individual uh, client, um, which is interesting because sometimes we make contrary decisions, right? Sometimes we oppose each other. Um, the, the second thing um, that I wanted to say is that although we enjoyed the movie, the movie actually played no role whatsoever in our legal strategies. We did enjoy the movie. Um, but third, that the, the executive summary of the torture report that is redacted and available online is a remarkable document. And for it had really two really important things that, uh, that uh, affected the military commissions. The, the first is the overall narrative. Like each of us knew parts of the story from our own client and little tidbits that had been released here and there, especially for uh, Nishiri and Mohammed and Abu Zubeda, which were the more information was released about them than anybody else. Um, and, but the, the placement of all these individual stories of men, of, of Muslim men placed in a broad context was incredibly valuable and important to us, helped us see relationships that we never saw before. But it also is remarkable in its detail in that the, the footnotes are incredibly valuable. And that includes the work of people like Jason Leopold to FOIA all the documents in the footnotes. Mm -hmm. um, it includes 
litigation in the military commissions over individual footnotes sometimes. We need that document in that individual footnote for, for Mr. Asawi or Mr. Ben Al-Sheba. Um, and so both in its, in its global structure and in its incredible detail, it was very valuable to us. Because obviously the United States did violate Article 3 of the Geneva Convention. Do you think that there will be repercussions? Do you think it's too late for international repercussions to occur? And to what extent does do the actions of the United States uh, essentially can they be used to validate the actions of other countries uh, who may not wish to follow the Geneva? Well, part of, uh, you know, in the middle of the book, I have a chapter where I'm really like tracking the accountability efforts, you know, the, the efforts to hold U.S. officials criminally accountable. First of all, so there was no criminal prosecutions of anybody involved with torture, you know, Americans involved with torture, except John Kiriakou, who was formerly a CIA uh, agent. And he, after he was out of the CIA, had sort of said that he, um, you know, he was the first person to sort of confirm that the CIA had used the tactic of waterboarding. So he spilled the Bush administration secrets, but it was the Obama administration that prosecuted him. But nobody else, you know, so, I mean, that's how criminal trials work in this country. And there, in this country, there was no um, sort of looking at the diff a few cases where people were, you know, the only option in this, you know, if there's not a criminal prosecution it would be a civil lawsuit. So there were several civil lawsuits brought on behalf of torture victims in U.S. courts, but every single one of them was thrown out or dismissed on the grounds that these issues were non-justiciable or that the person didn't have standing or that state secrets, you know, you know, precludes um, prosecution. But there were efforts over in particularly in Europe to hold individuals, you know, U.S. officials individually accountable. And the, the significant the two most significant places were Spain and and Germany. But in both of those, and there were like prosecutors that, you know, because there have been Spanish people, Spanish citizens tortured by the CIA, and there have been German citizens tortured by the CIA or German residents, and prosecutors were willing to go after the officials, Rumsfeld, you know, various generals or, or other officials. Um, and in the case of Spain, they would have gone after the torture lawyers, you know, the lawyers who advised on this. But the U.S. government, the Bush administration and the Obama administration, like hand in glove, used diplomatic pressure to force you know, those governments to give up their own cases. And so, and the reason they had to use diplomatic pressure was because they had no legal argument. Torture is always a crime. There's absolutely no right to torture. So, you know, in principle, anybody who, you know, engages in or abets torture can be prosecuted, should be prosecuted under international law, federal law, domestic law of other countries, et cetera. And so the inability to make a legal case defending what the government had done got the government from one administration to another to use diplomatic pressure to basically say, don't do this, don't do this. And so it leaves open, I mean, the, the lack of accountability when a superpower tortures and is never held to account, it damages the norm that was violated. And, and, and before 9-11, like many governments tortured, but when you get a government like the United States legalizing torture and then, you know, not taking any accountability once it's exposed, it's like, is torture illegal now? I mean, can we really honestly say that torture is still a crime? I mean, because the law doesn't enforce itself. The law is always a process of people interpreting and using the law. So is it a crime. I mean, it was it was a non-disputable. They call it Jus Kogan's norm. You know, is it still a Jus Kogan's norm not to torture people? We and this the United States has damaged principles that were bedrock, black, blue, um, black letter law kind of things. And we don't really know. I mean, I, I feel like this is the work of future generations of lawyers and courts. Like, fix this. Go to law school and fix this. You know, because if it's ruined by law, it has to be saved by law. I guess, I mean, the only thing I would add is just that, you know, we've been, this is something we work on a lot, uh, is trying to get, um, if not the internet. So let me, let me, let me put it this way. Let me take a step back. Do I think that, you know, the international community, do I think the security councils, you know, ever going to do anything? Do I think the general assembly is ever going to do it? No, right. I don't. Um, and there are reasons for that that are structural and go far beyond the scope of this, but 
there's not been no accountability. Exactly. It's just been this sort of drip, drip, drip from the international community for 20 some years now, right? Um, just on our case, right? Like we go out all the time and try to engage members of the international community, members, you know, the UN agencies, special rapporteurs, like special rapporteur for human rights and counterterrorism is actually currently on the down at Guantanamo for the first visit by any UN special rapporteur um, right now, right now um, at Guantanamo. And I will be perfectly honest, it is in part because all of us, like the Guantanamo bar, have fought for a very long time for that to happen. Um, they have pushed from the UN, we pushed from here, and the NGOs pushed. And so th that's finally happening. I think that's a big deal. Um, that is a measure of accountability. Uh, a few years ago, we got an opinion from the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention at the United Nations calling for Amar's immediate release because his detention qualifies as arbitrary and going through all the torture that he'd been through up until that point. Um, we've gotten you know, statements from international NGOs talking about the uh, conditions of confinement at Guantanamo and how they are unacceptable. Do those translate into enforcement measures? No, right? Almost never. But it means that at a minimum, people stay aware of what is happening at Guantanamo. And, you know, the hope is that through momentum over time and water like a rock, rotters and rocks and all of that, something will eventually happen. Um, you know, look, right now, Amar was just diagnosed with a spinal tumor um, a few weeks ago. And we are trying to figure out what to do about that because um, as you've just heard from me, uh, you can't, you know, it is not ideal to do surgery at Guantanamo. We're trying to figure out what to do. And um, if there is a solution, I think our partners in the international community may pay or play a role in, in, in helping us figure out what that solution might be. So we call on them all the time. It's just not on a big macro level that you would want to see, right, for the magnitude of crimes that we have committed. Another question from our online audience. This is, you mentioned how the CIA chose to share information concerning the torture of your client, uh, with the director of Zero Dark Thirty. Do you have an opinion on why they picked him specifically instead of any other detainee? Her. Oh, he, Amar. Amar. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, do, do you want that? No, go ahead. Um, go ahead. You were there at the time. Yeah, sure. Um, I think because Amar has a somewhat unique place in in sort of the spectrum of people who have held have been held at Guantanamo, and he is the nephew of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, uh, and one of the reasons why he is there is that family relationship, right? Not anything that he did, but his family relationship. At the same time. They were looking, so narratively, the place that, that I think that they were going was a person who has relatively little actual culpability, but there, there was a good reason that the, a good reason why the CIA would sweep them up. So they were looking for a character who uh, did not, had not killed anyone, had not carried a weapon, had not trained in Afghanistan, you know, and and who the allegations against were financial, that made money transfers from one place to another, which actually comes out in the movie, right? It's an important part of the movie, because narratively what happens is that the two torturer characters or the torturer and the associate and the accessory uh, characters um, then trick the character Amar saying, we, you gave us all this information, you don't remember it because you were being tortured at the time and you know, thank you so much, here please have falafel. Um, and so I think that they chose, and it was hard for people to put, like there are, there are news articles guessing what, who the detainee is in that film contemporaneous to it in 2013, they're just wrong. Like they, they think it's an amalgamation or they think it's somebody else and they're wrong. It's just a mar from beginning to end. And I think that they chose that character because it was a, a character with relatively little culpability, but because Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's nephew, which they emphasize in the movie, uh, it was, it gives permission to the audience uh, to validate the torture, which is which is one of the messages of the movie. 
which is that the the, the end justifies the means and um or at least that was my that's my deconstruction of the of the narrative having read all the reports about it yeah I mean, the, it shows the torture of Amar essentially leading to the capture and killing of Osama bin Laden which is just a completely false narrative yeah that part is not true but the, no, um, right. yeah. but but like the individual pieces of it yeah. like they it, it is clear that they chose that character for for elements of reality like his relationship and and his relatively minor culpability to you know the, for anything he was claimed to, to have done it's a good question i don't think i've yeah, ever gotten that right. question. yeah actually can i may just make one i know we're almost done but I'd just like to make a last point was one thing that has always driven me and it's i think it will come through in the book but I, like if anything the more i work on issues relating to torture and people who fight against it the more i am you know sort of like hang on and say that it is true like there's not much true in the world and especially when you're like a sociologist like you don't have to be you know social construction or whatever but like torture is you know, wrong, it's a crime and it's ineffective. And I think the reason why the CIA, so much about the CIA program is still secret is because there was this massive program that was an egregious failure based on nonsense, built on lies, et cetera. And so it's just really, that is like, it's, I mean, it's rare for an academic to have a topic that you can say like, what I believe is true. And everybody who doesn't believe me is wrong. And I'm actually correct on this one thing. <laughs> so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>